Greetings everyone and welcome back to the bench. I'm going to try and experiment something I've never tried. It's adding booster transistors to a chip amp and I'm going to try the LM386. Well you might say well, why don't you just get a stronger chip and use it instead of adding transistors. Well you could do that but this is after all the John Audio Tech channel and you know I like to try things, learn how circuits work so yeah, we got to do it this way. Now this circuit is nothing new. This is from my 1987 SGS book. Now they're called ST Microelectronics or you know whatever their name has changed to now. I think it's changed at least a couple times. But it's the TDA 2030A and they have this uh, booster transistor arrangement here. So what they're doing is connecting resistors in series with the power supply pins and to those power supply pins they connect the base of these output transistors and I'll explain how that works a little later. Well somebody emailed me asking about using this circuit on some chip amp and I said well sure why not try it. I've never really tried it before. I know a lot of amplifier designers and hi-fi people don't like these circuits because they do have some inherent issues. But if the distortion, stability, and it does give you some extra power, yeah, I'd like to try it out. The LM386 has pretty limited output power. I thought it was a good chip to try. See, these are the curves, supply voltage versus output voltage swing. And look at the four ohm line. You know, it just kind of flattens out. So, you know, if you have output swing that's not changing with increasing supply voltage, you're not getting any extra power, you're just getting waste heat. Same thing with an 8 ohm load. Up around 9 volts, it starts to flatten out. So you're not going to get much extra output. Now with a 16 ohm load, look at that, it's a nice straight line going about you know diagonal 45 degrees diagonal up so the chip seems to be suited more to for a 16 ohm load and you know it's okay with an 8 ohm load as long as you don't go beyond 9 volts so if we add the booster transistors we should be able to get more power and the ability to drive 4 ohm loads and get increased output power as we increase the supply voltage so that's one reason why I want to try using that chip. So what I've done here is draw a simplified circuit so I can explain how it works. And I should mention I want to try two different versions of these booster circuits. I'll do this one with the resistors in series with the supply pins and this one here that the output is somewhat unrelated to the chip itself. There's no modifying much of the amplifier circuit itself. So how does the circuit work? Well, it's pretty simple actually. You just have two transistors. The emitters are connected to the supply rails. The collectors are connected to the output node. And the bases are connected to the supply pins, the power supply pins on the chip amp. However, we add a resistor between the supply pin and the actual voltage rail on each side of the chip. Notice the relationship of that resistor to the base emitter junction. So what's going to happen when enough current flows through this resistor you'll develop a high enough forward voltage which is about 0.7 volts of the diode junction of the base emitter on the transistor to start it conducting so if you put a signal into the amplifier, when the voltage is low, the amplifier chip is not going to draw a lot of current. So let's say our signal is swinging up, so it's going to be drawing current from the positive side of the supply. And as the current goes higher and higher, eventually we'll have enough current flowing through this resistor, and it develops a 0.7 volt drop starting this transistor to conduct. So it's now helping this chip to supply current to the load. 
It's very important to note that it does not take over supplying current because this chip has to draw enough current to satisfy that 0.7 volt drop to keep this transistor turned on. So the chip and the transistor both are supplying current to the load. Now as the signal goes from positive to the negative side, the same thing happens on the negative side. So I don't need to go through all of that again. Now I am showing a dual rail supply here just to make it easier to explain. This will work just fine on a single supply where you have the supply voltage here and ground over here. One problem with this circuit is normally you bypass the supply rail right at the pin of the chip with the capacitor to ground. Well, the circuit makes that impossible because if you do that you form a low pass filter because now you have a changing voltage on this pin relative to ground and you just can't stick a capacitor there because it'll interfere with the operation of the circuit especially at high frequencies. So what we can do is connect a capacitor directly across the power supply leads and that's what this capacitor is doing here. Now this circuit should work pretty well with most chip amps that are kind of like op amps like those five pin chip amps. But other types of chip amps like the LM386 that have ground reference type inputs and bypass capacitors and things like that that connect to ground. You know, if I connect those to ground, it's going to disturb the circuit. I might have to connect those to the actual negative pin, so those will kind of be floating. So yeah, I'm not sure how the chip's going to behave in that condition. All right, I yacked on enough. Let's try this out, see what happens. Okay, I built up a circuit and got it working. So this is the LM386. These are those resistors that are in series with the supply. And the supply pins on the chip now connect to the base of these booster transistors. And of course the output connects to the collectors of those transistors. And I have a 4 ohm load we'll test with to see if it really does anything. So let's power this thing up and see what happens. Okay, this is the output waveform, one kilohertz signal. Not really liking what I see. You can probably see what's going on. We got a triangular-ish waveform. Kind of a little ripple in there. Now there's clipping. Are these transistors really doing anything? I'm using about four ohm resistors. So if you take 0.7 volts divided by four ohms, you get about 180 milliamps. I use, they're actually 3.9 ohm resistors, by the way. I figured I didn't want the LM386 doing any more than about 200 milliamps and have the booster transistors handle the rest. And let's see if I can zoom in here. Yeah, I think I see what's going on here. There's this straight region right here where the LM386 is doing the work but when we kick on the booster transistors they have a little bit more gain and it shoots up a little bit higher see how the slew rate is a bit higher here and on the negative side as well so yeah I'm getting some distortion from the circuit another problem I see is well the clipping I'm using a 9 volt supply and here's the clipping point. I have the scope set up to show me the uh, peak to peak. Well the problem is 5.32 volts peak to peak. Well, I'd like to see a little more giving I'm using a 9 volt supply. I'd like to see closer to 7 and I doubt it'd be any more than about seven or seven and a half volts. So we can see if those transistors are actually doing anything. I can remove the base connection to the upper transistor and see how it drops off. I'll plug that back in. And we'll try the bottom transistor. Yep. So those transistors are definitely working, but they're adding distortion. Let's go back up to clipping. 1.71 volts. 
about 730 milliwatts of output power and 4 ohms 9 volt load with a chip amp I would expect closer to one and a half watts of output so this is not really doing so hot okay so now I switched over to an 8 ohm load on the output and we get a little better swing you can see here 1.87 and what is that? It's 437 milliwatts of output. Well, that's less than what the LM386 alone can do at 9 volts. Let's see. So if I take off the upper transistor, see we're getting less help now because of the current being less using the 8 ohm. And, of course, same on the bottom. Oops. So I'm going to conclude at this point that this circuit is not really viable. I could look at expanding on this circuit, you know, getting it to work, but then we're throwing more parts into it. Now if you watch my channel a couple years ago, I added an actual discrete output stage to the LM386 and it worked. I got a lot more power. So I'm going to move on to the next circuit. Now here's the second circuit I want to try. This is a bit different in that it doesn't tamper with the amplifier chip itself. You know, we're not putting resistors in its supply rails. It still has its components. We don't have to worry about the ground referenced inputs and things like that on the LM386. So what's going on here is a very similar thing. Notice the base emitter relationship with this resistor. And the bases are tied together and tied to the output node of the chip. Well, if we took out this resistor, we'd require positive 0.7 volts to turn this transistor on and a negative 0.7 volts to turn on the bottom transistor. So that would leave us with a large dead zone and we get a really nasty distortion. So what we do is add a resistor from the output node of the chip to the output node of the amplifier or the load side so that the chip can send current to the output. Again, the chip amp is going to have to supply enough current so that we get a 0.7 volt drop to turn the positive transistor on or the, uh, the upper transistor and a negative 0.7 to turn on the lower transistor. Well, I can foresee an issue already. I still can see a switchover distortion. You know, when these transistors turn on, we might see a notch again where the slew rate changes because of the transistors are providing current to the load or it's taking some of the load off of the chip. Now, in this condition, it would be nice to have feedback where we can bring some of that signal back and clean it up. Well with the LM386 it has its gain internally set. It, it has some feedback inside that we cannot access though there is some provision to use negative feedback at least part of it bring it around so I don't know if this is going to work very well at all. It could be worse than the other circuit. It might work a little better. All I have to do is stop yakking and build it and see. Okay, so now I built out the circuit. It's a little simpler to put on the socket board than the other one. Less parts, but there it is. Let's see what it looks like. Okay, here's, here's the waveform. I don't have that sharing resistor connected right here because I just wanted to see what this looks like. Of course, you have that dead zone. So let me connect that resistor and it gets rid of that flat area. However, you can see the transition because the transistors can supply more current into the 4 ohm load. So we're getting that distorted area. If we zoom in on it here, you can see this is a nice straight line that's coming from the chip and then the transistors turn on that's the upper transistor, then the transistor turns off in that dead zone and then the lower transistor turns on. But we have a linearity issue here for sure. Oops, don't want to dial that knob. 
twist that knob. So these circuits rely on negative feedback to clean up the residual distortion here. And I don't know if I can do that with the LM386. Let me try a couple things. Another thing is the uh, peak output voltage is still limited by the IC. So if we dial out the clipping 1.8 volts. So we're getting 810 milliamps. So we're doing a little better than the other circuit. However, it's you know, it's still off from a more capable chip amp. Like the little TDA 7267 delivered probably closer to a, a watt and a half, if I remember correctly. I know it was over a watt, and this has not even given us a watt for them. So, yeah, I don't think this is even worth pursuing. And I tried a couple things. I tried some feedback, and... I'd get an oscillator or greatly reduced output swing before clipping, so greatly reduced power. The resistor that I used here was 3.9 ohms, and I dropped it to 2 ohms. So now it's a little cleaner, but we're getting more of a triangular waveform, which, would, which tells me it's laden with odd harmonics. And it also reduced our max output swing again. Or down under 700 milliwatts. Yeah, this is just not a circuit I would consider using. Lessons learned. Why do I consider my experiments a fail here? It was mainly due to the weak output swing. Now with a 9 volt supply, 4 ohm loads, I'd expect around a watt and a half of output, yet we weren't even hitting 1 watt. When you look at the circuit, the booster transistors, they're tied directly to the rails, there's no emitter resistors to cause a loss. It seems like you would get near rail-to-rail -rail output swing. But that's when you look closely into the circuit. That's not true. It's actually the output voltage of the IC which dictates the output voltage swing. Well, you have to remember that the output of the amplifier and the output from the booster transistors are tied together at this node. So the voltage has to be the same. Let's say the booster transistors tried to increase that voltage. Well, when the voltage increases, they're going to deliver more current to the load. So less is drawn from the amplifier IC. When that happens, less current flows through these emitter resistors, and that's going to dial back the current from the booster transistors. So it keeps everything in equilibrium. Okay, that doesn't really explain why we're losing so much voltage. The output swing of the LM386 is limited. It can't swing to the rails. Plus, we're hamstringing it with these resistors. They have a total of 1.4 volts drop. So that's why we're losing about 4 volts. If you remember on the scope, we measured about 5 volts peak to peak. So we lost about 4 volts. So you might be asking, why does it work with the TDA2030A when we looked at the data sheet? Well, that amplifier is working at a much higher voltage, so the loss of 4 volts is a much lower ratio. And since it allows the amplifier to operate with a 4 ohm load, you actually do gain some output power. But here at 9 volts, the loss is just too much, and we lose a lot of output power. The same with this circuit. You know, we were only getting 5 point something volts. Well, we still have to overcome positive 0.7 and negative 0.7 voltage drop that these transistors need. And we have limits with the output swing of the LM386 itself. So again, we lose quite a bit of overhead voltage there. So there you go. Interesting experiment with the LM386. Yeah, it didn't work out, but you know, that's the learning process. That's why I try these things. I want to see how they work. It's probably why you know, at least I've never seen these circuits used with an LM386. But, you know, I had to try it myself and see what's going on. Well, that'll do it for this one. Thanks for watching.